Yuma was a PhD student at Berkeley. He's currently at Stanford, and he will make the same trip a few more <laughs> times uh, in the future. Um, so Nima has worked on approximation algorithms, algorithmic game theory, and graph theory. And today we will hear about strongly ray measures, which is some a family of discrete measures that will measure, uh, capture negative dependence. So we will we will learn what that is, and we will see some applications. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so the talk today is based on uh, some of uh, my joint works with Leonid Horvitz, Shaina Wiskaran, uh, Iris Arzai, and Saberi and Mahit Um So I know that strongly widely measured is probably a strange word for many of you. Uh, so let me try to introduce the topic to you by uh, comparing it with some other measures, which perhaps more of you are familiar with. Uh, so this is a contrast picture between two worlds, the continuous world and the discrete world. Uh, the talk today is about uh, distributions which are discrete, but I want to first talk about the continuous world because the distributions there are more familiar to most people. Um, so continuous world. So uh, I'm working with distributions. So a distribution is just a non-negative function on Rn, uh, which is integrable. So the integral is finite. Uh, so it gives rise to a, a probability distribution. So if you normalize by the whole integral, you get a probability distribution. It's pretty normal. And one of the typical questions you can ask about these distributions is whether you can efficiently sample from them. Right? So that's you see a probability distribution. That's a computational question you can ask. Uh, another perhaps uh, uh, non-obvious question is whether you can find the mode of this distribution. So that's a question more for optimization, right? So you have a function, you just want to find the maximum of it. So in the continuous world, uh, there is a class of functions uh, which are tractable in, you know, for both of the questions I asked, for efficient sampling and for optimization. And those are lots of capabilities. So a log concave function is just a function whose log is concave. Or uh, you, can, uh, you can just uh, see the definition here. Instead of the additive thing you get for uh, concave functions, you get exponents because the log is the thing that's uh, concave. Um, so as I said, log concave functions are tractable uh, in terms of both efficient sampling and optimization. So perhaps one of the most celebrated results uh, uh, on this topic is the result of uh, Dyer et al., which was later improved by Lovage and Ben Pala, uh, which says that you can, given an oracle access to such a function, so you give it a point, it gives you the value. Uh, I'm sweeping some things under the rug. But uh, given oracle access, you can sample a point, uh, an approximate point uh, from this distribution using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so these are uh, Markov chains which are uh, formally known as uh, the ball block and the hit and run block, if you've heard of those terms. Uh, and of course, finding the mode of a log concave function is nothing but uh, maximizing a concave function. Uh, so you can just do it using any uh, convex programming framework that we left. So uh, these are some examples of log concave functions. Uh, so if you have a convex set, the indicator of it is log concave. Okay. Uh, so uh, actually using this uh, simple observation, you can show that uh, you, can, you can maximize a linear function over convex sets by just sampling from log concave distributions. Uh, there are many of the well-known uh, uh, distributions, such as the Gaussian distribution, or log concave. And then there are operations on log concave functions which preserve them. Okay? Uh, so one of them is if you do an affine transformation in the space, you still get a log concave function. Uh, if you condition on a variable having a certain value, it's like slicing through the uh, log concave function, you still get a log concave function. If you marginalize, meaning that you integrate over one variable, uh, you still get a log concave function. This is not as obvious as the previous one. Uh, if you do a convolution of two log concave functions, you still get a log concave function. And if you take the pointwise product of two log concave functions, you still get a log concave function. 
So you have this whole toolbox of constructing for constructing new lock computer functions. Okay. So uh, that's the continuous world. Uh, what I want to talk about is the discrete world, and perhaps measures that somehow have similarities to the lock on key functions in the continuous one. So uh, let me let's let's act, let's try to uh, formalize this. So the measures that I'm going to be working with, I'm going to represent them with a function from z to the n to r, uh, which are non-negative. So they have a mass on each point in z to the n. Right? Sometimes I'm going to be working with uh, just uh, Boolean vectors, so 0, 1 to the n, distributions over the hypercube. Uh, and again, they give rise to a, any such function gives rise to a distribution. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that my function is always, always has finite support. Right? So, uh, the sum is always finite. You can always divide and get a probability distribution. And again, you can ask the same questions. Can you efficiently sample from such a distribution, or can you find the mode of it? Okay. So the real question we want to answer is, what is the analog of lock concavity in discrete distributions? So here is a wrong attempt. If you just, uh, if you just take the lock concavity definition from the continuous world and plug it in into the discrete world, uh, well, you get something. So uh, this is basically the most general inequality that you might hope to uh, satisfy. So for any values, for any points, k, uh, kappa 1 through kappa m, and any values alpha 1 through alpha m, such that these things have a meaning. So everything is an integer vector. Uh, this inequality should be satisfied. Okay? So these, these functions have been studied, actually, in the one-dimensional case. Okay? So if you have a sequence of values, they're log concave, even only if they satisfy this inequality. These, uh, they have some nice properties. They have been studied. Uh, but the problem is that if you are looking at distributions from the hypercube, uh, then this inequality says nothing. Every distribution on the hypercube would be captured by this. Right? So that's clearly too large a class for us uh, to be able to handle. So that's a wrong attempt. Um, so the correct attempt is a definition uh, known as strongly Riley. So this definition, for this definition, I have to define this thing called the generating polynomial distribution. Okay. So you can encode any given discrete distribution into a multivariate polynomial. Okay. Uh, the coefficients are going to be the values of the uh, of the distribution, and then uh, each monomial, the exponents of the monomial, are going to capture the point at which the distribution is being evaluated. Uh, and then you just sum all of these monomials. Okay? So for this distribution, which has values 1, 2, 3, 5, I have four monomials with the coefficients 1, 3, 2, 5. And then each point is z1 to some power, z2 to some power. That power is between z1 and 1, because uh, I have uh, my distribution is supported on the two-dimensional hyper. So that's the way you define a generating polynomial. Now, the definition of stronger ID is there is no way to go around it. It's through this generating polynomial. Um, so the definition is that if you uh, plug in complex numbers into the generating polynomial, which have positive imaginary parts, then the polynomial never gets zero. Okay. Let me pause that <laughs> for a second. Uh, so you don't want any roots which have positive imaginary parts in all of the components. Okay, so that's the definition. Uh, perhaps I can convince you that it's a natural definition by considering the one-dimensional case. So when you say not equal to zero, it doesn't matter whether the resulting value is like purely real or purely imaginary. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it, I mean, if you're plugging in complex numbers, you should expect to see complex numbers. Right? Yeah, but it's, it's never going to be zero. So, so let, me, let me at least try to show you that it's not that unnatural uh, by considering the one-dimensional case. Okay? So in the one-dimensional case, you're dealing with a univariate polynomial. Okay? Uh, so the polynomial has no roots if and only if uh, has no roots with positive imaginary part, if and only if all of its roots are real. 
The reason is that when you're dealing with a univariate polynomial, the roots come in conjugate first. So if you have no roots in the upper half plane, you have no roots in the lower half plane. Therefore, the roots come in, the roots must all be real. Therefore, you can uh, factorize your polynomial in this way. Okay? So a product of linear terms. Right? Now, if you think about it a little bit, uh, this, polyn this generating polynomial corresponds to a very well studied uh, random variable. So if you only had one uh, uh, if you only had one factor in this factorization, then your distribution would just be a Bernoulli random variable, right? It can either take the value zero or one, right? But it's not hard to see that when you multiply generating polynomials, you're just taking the convolution of the distributions. Or in other words, if you think in terms of random variables, you're just summing independent copies of random variables. So any polynomial which factorizes in this way uh, would be a sum of independent Bernoulli's. So in the one-dimensional case, anything that is strongly Riley is a sum of Bernoulli's, and the reverse is also true. Okay. And by well-known facts, we know that uh, sum of Bernoulli's is log concave. So this definition actually satisfies the wrong attempt that we were trying to do. Um, it's actually also ultra log concave. It, it satisfies something stronger than log concavity. But that doesn't matter much to us. Okay. Any questions on this? Sorry, some of Bernoulli's is a discrete distribution, right? Yeah. Did you define what log concavity was for Sorry? discrete? I thought the problem was that we didn't have a good definition for discrete distributions being concave. Yeah, I mean, uh, for the one-dimensional case, at least, we have a good definition for log concavity. It's just that the product of any two, this value and this value uh, must be at most the square of this value. Okay. So, so for the one-dimensional case, it makes sense. Uh, for higher dimensions, it doesn't make sense much. Uh, but anyways, I'm working with strong related distributions. I'm just saying that in the one-dimensional case, at least it uh, satisfies the log concavity. Is it easy to see that a sum of Bernoulli should look log concave? Uh, so the easiest way I know is through algebraic operations on the generating polynomial. <laughs> um, so, so basically what you can do is you can, when you have a real rooted polynomial, you can take derivatives of it, and it will remain real rooted. Okay? So you can, by taking derivatives, you are killing the first values. Okay? And then uh, you can also do an operation which reverses uh, or mirrors this distribution, and then you can kill off the other values. At the end of the day, you will get, you can kill off all values except three, three consecutive ones. Okay. Now you have a, a univariate uh, polynomial of degree two, Right, which has real roots. And if you remember high school math, uh, the coefficients must satisfy an inequality. That gives you log on cavity. A, a degree two univariate polynomial must have, it has some inequality with, uh, with its coefficients, right? E squared bigger than four, uh, eight times or something. Right? But some of, uh, some of log concave distributed not log concave. Uh, not necessarily. Yeah. So that's why you can't really yeah. So that's why you can't? And that's why you can't. You don't have a simpler proof. Oh. oh, but then maybe it follows from convolution. So convolution does, is not, yeah. uh, does not preserve lock on cavity necessarily. Oh, yeah, yes. It, not so much convolution. Oh. In the discrete case? As in you meant, you stated that in the continuous case. Uh, so in the continuous case, it does. In the discrete case, it doesn't. Oh, uh, right. So uh, okay. So the second example is uh, if you don't sum up the coin tosses, or if you don't sum up the Bernoulli's, and consider them as independent things, you still get a strongly related distribution. Okay. So you you flip n coins, which have different biases, and then you consider a vector, which is the result of your coin tosses. Basically, the, the first coin toss would give you a bit, the second coin toss would give you a bit, and so on. So you would get a bit uh, vector in the hypercube, and that would be a distribution that is uh, still strongly Riley, 
uh, because the polynomial can be factored in this way, right? Um, so I have, a, again, a linear uh, term for each of my coin classes, but the variables are now different, right? Now, it's easy to see that if I plug in uh, complex numbers with positive imaginary parts, none of these factors would become zero. Uh, so therefore, this uh, polynomial is still, uh, is still strongly right. Okay. Uh, perhaps the, mo uh, the first non-trivial example of strongly right distributions is the distribution of random spanning trees in a graph. So if you have a graph and you uh, pick a spanning, tree of, a, span, a spanning tree of it uniformly at random uh, and consider the indicator vector of that spanning tree. Okay? So that lives in an m-dimensional space where m is the number of edges. Okay? So for each edge, you just record whether it's in the spanning tree or not. You get a 0, 1 vector. Uh, <laughs> this polynomial is going to uh, be strongly right. Um, And the name Riley actually comes from this connection. Okay? Uh, so there is this thing called the Rayleigh monotonicity property uh, in uh, electrical networks, which says that if you basically uh, decrease the effect, de decrease the resistance of uh, something in an electrical network, the effective resistances uh, never go up. Okay? Uh, so that you can show is. Uh, is equivalent to this condition, that if you, uh, from the distribution, from the spanning tree distribution, if you condition on an, on an edge being in your spanning tree, the probability of any other edge being in the tree goes, uh, never goes up. Basically, either goes down or stays the same. Okay? So that's, that's negative correlation. Okay? For any two edges, this one being in the tree implies this one is less likely to. Uh, so strongly Riley implies this, but it implies a lot of other things. That's why it's uh, uh, being strongly Riley is known to be one of the strongest forms of negative dependence. Uh, so the names all come from this. Uh, so the last example I want to give, which includes the previous uh, spanning tree case, is the case of determinantal distributions. Uh, so let me first give you a subset of the terminal distributions. So suppose that you have a bunch of vectors in some high-dimensional space. Uh, you want to select a subset of them. Uh, but for every subset, the probability you select that subset is going to be proportional to the volume spanned by those vectors squared. So in this case, these two would be uh, picked with the with probability proportional to the volume of this thing squared, or the determinant squared. You fix the size of the subsets. Uh, so they they always live in some d-dimensional space, and you have to pick the vectors to get a non-zero. Uh, but this is not the most general determinantal distribution. So uh, the most general determinantal distribution is given via a, a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, so if you are given a positive semi-definite matrix L, you pick a subset of the rows or the columns. Uh, with probability proportional to the determinant of the subsquare given by the that subset from the rows and that subset from the columns, the same subset. But why is this more general? Can't you just yeah. factor out the Laplace the L matrix as B B transpose with the columns of B I? Uh, is it exactly the same distribution? This doesn't give you the same distribution because uh, this distribution can have varying sizes on the sets. Oh, so it's conditioned on the set size being exactly N. Then you get this. Then you get the yeah. Okay. Uh, so here is how you can see that this distribution is a special case of this one. If if you are given a vector, if you are given these vectors, uh, you can consider the gram matrix of uh, these vectors, where the entry i j is just a dot product between the vector i uh, v i and v j, uh, and then the uh, the sub determinant of uh, uh, defined by a subset S would just be this volume square. Uh, it's just the determinant of something times its transpose, so it gets squared. That's where the square is coming from. So the generating polynomial of uh, this distribution 
We can write it as a concise determinant. Uh, let's not worry too much about why this is true, but uh, uh, but basically the fact that these are strongly Riley comes from the fact that you can write this as a determinant, and then uh, you show basically that this doesn't have any roots in the upper half plane uh, by using the fact that every symmetric matrix has uh, real eigenvalues. Okay, so it somehow reduces to that, but I don't want to go into the details. Uh, but one thing to also note is that the generating polynomial of uh, this is easily computable, given uh, the matrix L. Okay. Because you can just uh, compute the determinants. But uh, you mean com given ZIs, right? No, given ZIs. Not yes. as a symbolic component. Right, yeah. Given ZIs, you can compute this polynomial. So and one more question. The, the, one, the previous one that you defined with ZI squares, this captures the standard redistribution, right? Yes. Uh, so in the spanning tree case, these vectors would be, uh, for, each, for each edge you would have a vector, and it would be uh, 1 on one vertex, and minus 1 on the other vertex, and 0 everywhere else, and you can show that those, uh, the determinants somehow work out. Okay. All right, so these were the examples we saw, some of Bernoulli's, independent Bernoulli's, random spanning trees and determinantal distributions. This one actually captures all of these other ones. Uh, so perhaps a natural question is whether, uh, whether we should just consider determinantal distributions and forget about strong UID measures. But there are actually operations which don't preserve being determinantal, which I will talk about later. Um, there are operations that preserve uh, being strong UID, but don't preserve being determinantal. That's why you have to consider this more general class. So from now on, for simplicity, I'm assuming that my distribution is homogeneous, uh, meaning that uh, if, it's, uh, if it's supported on the hypercube, uh, then it has exactly the, bit, the one bits uh, in its support. Okay. Or you can think of it as the generating polynomial having exactly the pre-D for each polynomial. Uh, it makes my notation uh, more simple, but the results, most of the results I'm going to talk, be talking about would carry for now homogeneous. <coughs> uh, it's also not a strong assumption because if you're given any uh, strongly related distribution, if you slice it to some degree d, so if you only consider the terms which have degree d, uh, that's still going to be strongly right. Okay. Uh, right. And uh, if you were able to compute the generating polynomial of the original one, you can also compute the generating polynomial of the sliced one. Uh, it's basically some uh, algebraic tricks. You, uh, you homogenize your polynomial, and then you compute the uh, degree, t, t, uh, degree d terms uh, uh, by using polynomial interpolation. Uh, I don't want to go much into the details of that either. Um, Okay, so the questions we were asking were efficient sampling and optimization, or finding the mode. Right? Uh, so the first result I want to talk about is efficient sampling from these uh, distributions. So here, I'm assuming that uh, you don't have access to the generating polynomial, because if you have access to the generating polynomial, sampling becomes very, very easy. You only have access to an oracle, which gives you uh, the value of your distribution at any given point, similar to the continuous case. So, um, so for strong UI distributions, we were able to show that uh, a very natural Markov chain Monte Carlo method mixes fast. Okay? Uh, so the Markov chain is defined uh, by uh, basically considering all points in your distribution and connecting any two of them uh, that differ in exactly two bits. Because your uh, distribution is homogeneous, they can't differ in one bit. They can, they can differ in two bits or an even number of bits. Right? So I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, drawing uh, an edge from each state of my Markov chain to uh, any state uh, which differs from it uh, within two bits. And then I'm doing a, a Markov chain uh, walk on this uh, uh, graph with a Metropolis filter. So this is a very well-known technique in uh, Markov chains that you 
So basically, from each state, you pick a random neighbor, you go to it if it's, uh, if its distribution is higher than you. And if it's lower, you go to it with some probability, which is the ratio of the value of the distribution at the destination divided by the value of the distribution at the source. Um, so it's a metropolis filter. It's a little gram one thing. Um, so the result that we have is that this Markov chain gives you an epsilon approximate sample in time which is uh, nd squared log n, roughly. Okay. So the one thing that I want you to uh, get from this point in time is that this is almost linear in the number of uh, uh, in the number n. Which is the number of bits that we have basically. So if d is much smaller than n, this is a very fast method. This is almost, if d is constant, this is almost linear. So you mean what is d here? So d would be the homogeneity degree. Um, so, right, so, for, for, so if I was considering spanning trees? Uh, so if n, you're considering spanning trees, this is not a good result. Uh, so, right, so n, n would be the number of edges, and d would be basically the number of vertices mm -hmm. minus one. Okay. But this is independent of what the degree is. You're, it is possible that your distribution, you're only able to swap out, say, two, like one edge at a time, but yeah, or, okay, that's, that might be too strong, but maybe two or three edges at a time, and yet it would mix fast. Uh, it so could be, D could be constant, and yet it's, yet yeah. it would mix fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing that I also should mention here is that this mixes fast from a warm start. Uh, but you can get a warm start very easily by 3D algorithm. Uh, warm start just means that the, you, sh you should start from a point which doesn't have a very, very low distribution. Um, okay, so what are the applications of this? Well, um, there is this problem of uh, diverse subset selection. Okay, so uh, usually I describe this problem by uh, by this example. So suppose that you, you are searching for documents referring to the term apple, right? Now you might be referring to the company apple or the fruit apple, right? And uh, your search engine uh, has to basically give you a set of documents, and it doesn't know which one you're uh, thinking about. So should it give you this subset or this subset? Uh, so this subset has more diversity, and it's more likely to satisfy your query. So probably it's better to return this one, right? So how is this captured by our model? Well, usually uh, people assume that uh, all these documents are represented by a feature vector in some space, right? And the hope is that these features are in a way that uh, things that are diverse uh, span the space or give you a large volume. So uh, if you return a subset uh, whose probability is proportional to the volume squared of, that, uh, of the vectors in that subset, then uh, the hope is that uh, you're, you're returning a diverse subset with high probability. Um, it has been used in uh, uh, many contexts in machine learning, um, but perhaps the more uh, interesting application to uh, theorists, at least, uh, is that of lower rank approximation. Okay. So here the problem is you're given a matrix A, and you want to find a rank D matrix, uh, which is as close as possible to it in the uh, Frobenius norm. Right? So the result that has been shown, uh, uh, known as volume sampling, is that if you uh, sample a subset of the rows of this matrix, the number of rows you have to sample is just O of D over epsilon. Okay? But your sampling has to, uh, cannot be uniform. It has to have weights which are proportional to the uh, volume of those rows times their transpose, or the volume of those rows squared, basically. The same probability distribution that we've been considering. If you do this, uh, then uh, in expectation, you get a 1 plus epsilon approximation uh, to the best rank. Uh, the best rank D to the best rank D matrix, basically. And you're only selecting from the subsets of the rows. Okay? And then you're just projecting everything else to the subset. So uh, this gives you a fast uh, way to basically compute such a 
low rank matrix under some a lot of assumptions. So does this result actually beat the bounds given by? Uh, no, there is actually a new result which beats this. <laughs> so how, how, what would be the chain to sample here? Sorry? What would be the chain to sample here? Do we start with D over epsilon and start extending out one? Yeah, 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 yeah. So just one? Just one. And that would really mean, so now you would be linear in the size of the matrix? Yeah. Well, it's polynomial in D. In D over epsilon. But no, why would it be polynomial in D over squared? Because it has it had D squared. D squared, but how many should you be exchanging at every step? That's just one. Oh, just one. If you just extend one, then D is one, right? Oh, no, D is the D size, is the of, size your of your subset. Sorry, here. sorry, sorry. I thought uh, D was your set of neighbors. D is the size of. The Thank you. Um, so yeah, there is a new result which beats this, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, let's go on to finding the mode. Uh, so this is the optimization side of things. So here, you can't really hope to get an up, get an exact thing. Uh, uh, there are actually hardness results, which say uh, that uh, for, even for determinantal distributions, uh, you can't do better than O of 1 to the D approximation. Uh, and we can actually achieve the same an upper bound matching that. Uh, so the problem here is you want to find uh, a point in your distribution which maximizes the value of the distribution. So the algorithm we have for it is very simple. You solve a convex program. So the so you have a polynomial, uh, the generative polynomial. You if you could uh, if you could plug in zero one variables into the generating polynomial, you would fish out one of the coefficients. Uh, so if you could optimize over the set of 0, 1 vectors, then you would be able to uh, optimally solve this problem. But obviously, you can't do that, so you relax. And let these variables be just <coughs> positive uh, or non-negative uh, real value variables. And then uh, being strongly Riley implies that the generating polynomial is log concave over the uh, Set of positive real numbers over the positive board. So, okay, I'm not going to prove that. Uh, it's actually uh, two or three pages of proofs. Uh, but you, but but if you're the only the only place you're using uh, strongly Riley is that uh, this generating polynomial is log concave and you can solve this concave program. Okay. So once you solve this. Uh, you output one uh, uh, one point uh, kappa uh, whose probability is proportional to z one to uh, to the monomial basically uh, defined by the kappa. Okay. Um, so it's a probabilistic algorithm. It outputs a probabilistic solution, and the whole point is to prove that the in expectation you're close to the optimal. What is it? So the solution to the program is uh, zero one. No, real it's value. solution to the program is the real value. The solution to the sample concave program is real value. Uh -huh. uh, samples are zero. They give you some z one through z d. Yeah. Right. Those define some probability distributions uh, on the kappas. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you output the kappa with this probability. Right. Okay. Uh, so basically. Every every subset would be every zero one vector would be output with probability proportional to a to a product of these zeros. Um, but so that second step is also that second step you can do uh, by dynamic programming. Let's say you can basically compute the so so this probability distribution you can compute its generating function uh, by let's say dynamic programming. And whenever you can uh, compute the generating function of uh, self by function. determinant computation, sorry, by the determinant computation, you can also probably do the determinant. Yeah, but you can also do dynamic program. This is a very simple distribution. So can, okay. maybe can you tell what would this mean, for example, for spanning trees, and then maybe it will be uh, for spanning trees, what would this be? So this would be the whole graph. So this would be like you are trying to sample a. a uh, basically, you're trying to sample uh, uh, 
just any subset of n minus one edges, not necessarily a spanning tree, with probability which is proportional to the values uh, on those edges. Okay. So there is no restriction of being a spanning tree. That's why it's very easy to sample yeah. um, um, So the whole point is that if your variable satisfies just this inequality that they sum up to be, then the generating polynomial or the normalizing factor of this distribution would at most be bounded by e to the d. So you, you only have to normalize by a factor of e to the d. Uh, and that immediately gives you that this is an e to the d approximation. Because in expectation, you're getting exactly the value of this concave program divided by the normalizing factor. And the normalizing factor can be at most e to the d. Therefore, this is an e to the d. And as I said before, there are hardness results which show that uh, you can't do better than constant to the D. Um, so maybe you can improve the E, but uh, you can't go below, below constant. Excuse me. Yeah. Do you know what the hardness result uses? For? Uh, it's, sorry, I forgot. Uh, it's just a direct reduction. So okay. it's, uh, it, uh, it's, it's a p not equal to p. Forgot. Maybe it's three. maybe it was just three sets itself. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, so, what is finding the mode good for? Well, uh, there is this uh, canonical example that I always use, uh, which is that of sensor placement, uh, or you can think of it as feature selection. So let's say that we have uh, a bunch of thermometers placed at various points in Google's campus, let's say. And then somebody has to physically walk to them and read them to basically gather data. So we don't want to read all of them at once. We just want to select a subset of k of them to go and read. Right? Which subset should we select? Uh, well, one of the criteria that people consider is uh, maximizing the entropy of the information that we can get. So if you can assume that if you, if you assume that all these thermometers have a joint Gaussian distribution for their readings, right, given by the covariance matrix sigma, then what you want to do is you want to uh, select a subset of these thermometers that maximizes their entropy. And the entropy uh, of a bunch of Gaussian random variables can be written like this. It's just a constant multiple of the, sorry, there's a determinant missing here, the log determinant of uh, the covariance matrix plus another constant. Okay? So again, you want to select the subset that maximizes the log determinant of uh, sigma <laughs> defined by that subset. Uh, so the distribution that we had before, the determinant of distribution, it's like you're trying to find the mode of it. And using this algorithm, you can approximately solve it. That's interesting that uh, many people consider, uh, so because entropy is a submodular function, many people always, many people uh, consider the usual greedy algorithm for submodular maximization. But greedy doesn't have any guarantees here because the entropy can be negative and it's not even monotone here. Uh, but this one gives you uh, the guarantee of maximizing the entropy within an additive log d error. All right, uh, so let me uh, come back to the comparison between the continuous world and the discrete world. Uh, so lock on k functions on one side, strong reality distributions on the, one, on the other side. So I've shown that for both of them, we can do efficient sampling. Uh, in the continuous world, you can efficiently find the exact, max, exact mode. Uh, in the discrete world, you can find it approximately. But uh, so these were the two operations that we wanted. Uh, but we also uh, we also went over a bunch of operations that preserve lock concavity in the continuous world, right? So what are their counterparts in the discrete world? Uh, quick, quick one for the entropy problem. Uh -huh. Are there lower bounds for additive? Uh, for the entropy problem, yes. Uh, it's tight. It's it's tight. Yes. There was some uh, non-monotone, some modular. Yeah, but, but here entropy can even be, become negative. So, oh, okay. so you need uh, additive anyway. Yeah. Log of the determinant, there is no reason for it. 
Um, okay. So in the continuous world, you had affine transforms. In the discrete world, not every affine transform is going to give you z to the n, right? Uh, but at least the basic, one of the basic affine transforms you can do would give you a strong realized distribution. I call it symmetrization. <coughs> so if you have a strong realized distribution, if you just, so if x1 through xn are random variables which have a jointly, which have a joint strong realized distribution, you can just sum them up and you still get a strong realized distribution. Great. That's a x1 easy fact. Uh, what happens to the polynomial, the generating polynomial, is that you're replacing all the variables by a single one. And it's very easy from, to see from this transformation that uh, not having roots in the uh, upper half plane would be preserved. So the second one was conditioning. Again, conditioning in the discrete case uh, still holds. Uh, so if you condition on one of these variables being zero, it's like you are plugging in zero for, for that variable. Uh, and by some continuity theorems and complex analysis, you can show that this polynomial still doesn't have any roots in the uh, upper half plane. And therefore, we still get a strong value distribution. Uh, if you condition on a variable being one, it's like you are taking the partial derivative with respect to that variable. So any term that doesn't have that variable disappears. Uh, and again, this is by Rolle's theorem uh, that uh, if this polynomial uh, doesn't have any roots in the upper half plane, the resulting polynomial also doesn't have any roots in the upper half plane. So, any, so all of these uh, probabilistic operations have, a, have an algebraic meaning, and you can uh, easily, dedu uh, easily reason about the location of the roots. That's the basic point. Marginalization is easier. So if you have there shouldn't be pluses here. It's just next KSN. Um, so if you have a bunch of variables, if you just ignore one of them, the remaining ones are still strong really. It's like plugging in one for one of the variables. And again, using continuity theorems, you can show that the polynomial doesn't have any roots in the upper half plane. Uh, convolution is probably the easiest case. Uh, if you convolve uh, two distributions, which are strong really, it's like you are just multiplying the generating polynomials. This one doesn't have any roots in the upper half plane. This one doesn't have any roots in the upper half plane. Therefore, the product doesn't have ones. So the only difference is the pointwise product. So in the continuous world, uh, pointwise product of log concave distributions is log concave. But in the discrete world, that's not the case. Okay? Uh, and I, I don't want to give you an example because it would be too cumbersome. But an easy way to see why it shouldn't be true is because if you're, if, if uh, strong UI distributions were closed on their product, you could just uh, take the product of one strong UI, distribu strong UI distribution with itself and basically take powers of it. And now, because you can do efficient sampling from a strong UI distribution, once you do enough powers, it's like you're finding the mode. Right? Because after taking a high enough power, the only thing that survives is basically the mode. Uh, so you would be able to find the mode, but we know that we shouldn't be able to do this. Okay? So the product of strong value measures is not strongly Riley, but there is still some hope. Uh, what we proved is that the operations that you can do for strong value distributions, you still can do some of them for, part, for the distribution resulting from the uh, pointwise product. Okay. So if you have uh, two distributions, mu and nu, uh, and if you have oracle access to their generating polynomials, then you can compute approximations to these two values. Okay. So this would be basically the integral of the uh, product distribution, and this would be the mode of the product distribution. Okay. And the approximations are still, uh, they're are, they are going to be uh, roughly e to the d. Uh, constantly. And then are there lower bounds for this? Sorry? Are there lower bounds for this? Uh, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, for this one, there are lower bounds. For this one, there aren't. Uh, but there is a, so if you can, OK, so let me actually make a comment here. So the only types of approximation you can hope for these types of problems are either 1 plus epsilon 
or constant to the d or 1 plus epsilon to the d. Uh, because if you have, let's say, a constant to the d to the 0.99 approximation, there is a very easy uh, trick of boosting that to 1 plus epsilon. Okay, so, so there is no intermediate approximation. Okay, so you can, you can basically take uh, these joint products of these polynomials and then uh, compute the approximation on that product and then take the roots and so on. Um, so I don't, I, I don't uh, want to bore you with the details. But yeah, as soon as you go below this, you're, you're at 1 plus s. Uh, so, there are, so, so this problem, computing this, uh, captures, uh, uh, captures uh, some counting problems for which we currently don't have any 1 plus epsilon approximation. So it would be a very surprising thing to get uh, better than this. But like, uh, for example? Mixed discriminant. Uh, computing the mixed discriminant of a bunch of positive semi definite matrices is captured by this, mm -hmm. uh, but we currently don't have any uh, anything better than constant to the uh, approximation. So this algorithm generalize to multiple distributions? Uh, no. Three? So yeah. So if you take as soon as you take more than three, uh, even uh, verifying whether the whole distribution is zero or not becomes NPR. Oh, more, more than three. So three or more. Three or more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can reduce finding a, a TSP toward two. Uh, okay. um, so, what are some of the applications of this? Well, uh, the canonical one I want to give is counting the number of bipartite matchings. So, assume that you have a bipartite graph uh, like this. Uh, there is the outside, there is the north side, and the south graph. Um, so I'm going to define two distributions. The distributions are going to be on subsets of the edges, basically. One distribution is like this. You, for each vertex on the bottom side, you pick one, one of its uh, adjacent edges. Right? And you do this independently for all of the vertices. Uh, so you might get something like the orange thing that we see here. There is no guarantee that they, this will produce a matching. Uh, it's just, it just looks like a matching from the bottom side of the graph. Okay. So nu is going to do the reverse. It's going to pick uh, edges from the top side of the graph. Right. And now you can, you can easily see that the number of matchings would be basically the integral of the product distribution. Because anything that survives here would be a matching on the bottom side and then on the top side. So, uh, so the terms here are exactly the matches. Uh, like I said, there are more gen there are generalizations of bipartite <coughs> matching like mixed dis like mixed discriminant, uh, which you can still solve using this method, and for which we don't have one plus epsilon approximation. Uh, for bipartite matching, we do have one plus epsilon approximation, but it's randomized, and our methods are deterministic, so it still matches the best known deterministic uh, approximation algorithms. Okay, uh, maybe I'll skip this problem in the interest of time. So there is, there is some uh, problem in algorithmic game theory called, uh, known as Nash social welfare maximization. Because of its co uh, close connection to bipartite matching, you can, use this to, you can use this machinery to solve it, approximately solve it. It's an optimization problem. And you still uh, have, uh, so for most of the optimization problems sol solved by these machineries, you, you have matching lower bounds. For the counting problems, you usually don't. Uh, so again, you match the matching around here. Uh, OK, so I want to give you a brief sketch of the ideas involved uh, in the proof of this. So we have two distributions, mu and u. And we want to compute the integral of the product distribution. Okay? That's our goal. Uh, we also have access to their generating polynomials, right? So Look at the generative polynomial of mu. Okay, so it's a sum which has one of the things that we want, the mu values, right? The other things are monomials. Okay, so mu values are multiplied by some monomials. If I could ensure that these monomials are exactly equal to new values, then I could just if I could find z1 through zn such that the the monomial corresponding to kappa is equal to nu of kappa, 
then this sum will exactly be what I want to compute, right? So I can just plug in the values into my generating formula and uh, fish out the results. Yeah. Uh, so taking the bipartite matching case, uh -huh. um, so where do we have access to GMU? Oh, okay, yeah. So GMU would be a product of linear terms. Uh, for each vertex, you have a linear term, which is the sum of the variables adjacent to a vertex. Okay. Uh, and then you just multiply all of these together. Okay. Here. Okay. Uh, okay. So, but it's too much to hope for. Uh, it's too much to hope that the that we can find uh, z one through z n such that the, the monomial always match the new values. So, but, so what we are going to go after is a one-sided inequality. So we ensure that uh, we pick z1 through zn such that they are always at least as large as the new values. Okay? Uh, the reason we are going on this side is because new values could become zero, but these things can never be. So we have to go with the upper bound. Uh, so if I was able to find z1 through zn such that this inequality was satisfied for every point, then I could plug in z1 through zn through my generating polynomial, and I could find an upper bound for the quantity I'm trying to compute. Okay. In fact, I can search for the minimum such upper bound. Okay. So that's a usual trick, right? So once you have an upper bound, you usually try to find the best such upper bound, and then you hope that there is some duality result that maybe gives you the other side as well. Right? Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to find uh, the best z1 through zn, such that uh, this inequality is always satisfied. And for all the for all such z values, uh, I find the, the one that minimizes my generating polynomial. Okay. That's the best upper one I can get. Now, two things with this program, with this mathematical program. First, it can be turned into a convex program. It's actually what's known as uh, what is known. It's actually a program known as the uh, geometric program, if you've, ever, if you've ever heard of that term. Uh, <laughs> so roughly the idea is that if you replace the, uh, the polynomial itself with the log of it, and if you replace the variables with the log of the variables, then everything becomes complex. Any, any, any polynomial with non-negative coefficients has this property, that its log is, con is convex in the log of its variables. Uh, okay. And uh, once you replace zi's with log of zi's, this inequality becomes an in a linear inequality. Right? So, so now I'm trying to basically solve the convex program, and perhaps I can do it. The only problem is that I have potentially an exponential number of linear inequalities here. Okay. So I have potentially exponentially linear inequalities of this form. Uh, what do I do with them? Well, what if I replace this side, uh, which could take arbitrary values, basically, uh, with a stronger thing, with an upper bound for it? Okay. So uh, this is what Gurwitz had already shown, that if you're <laughs> looking for just one single coefficient of one of these polynomials, there is an easy upper bound for it. Okay. Uh, so forget the minimum. Okay, so for any y value, for any y values, uh, I want to say that the coefficient here, this inequality, is satisfied. Okay, so uh, the kappa i's are zero ones, right? So assume that all of them are one for now. Okay, so what am I doing? Well, I'm I'm dividing my generating polynomial for new by the product of y one through y n. So this produces a constant term, which is the coefficient of the monomial y1 through yn. And the other terms I don't care about because they are just non-negative. Right? So this is this side is always bigger than this side. Right? For zero values, you can see that those value, those variables uh, would, would actually be set to zero anyways. Right? Um, so it's not that hard to see that this inequality holds. And now instead of uh, Instead of satisfying this inequality, I'm just going to uh, make sure that this is bigger than this side. Okay. And now the trick is that this function, the right-hand side, is a concave function in the kappas. 
throughout the whole hypercube, not just zero one variables. Okay. This again uh, follows from the log concavity of the polynomial itself, the generating polynomial itself. So that's where I'm using real estate. And this relaxation doesn't lose anything. This relaxation loses something. <laughs> yeah. Because for for intermediate values, you might have you might be satisfying a stronger inequality. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are still going to meet our approximation. Um, so anyways, after, after using some duality and rearranging things, you arrive at this uh, uh, convex concave saddle point problem. Uh, so there are, uh, so you can see that uh, both of the generating polynomials are present here. And then if you, uh, if you replace the variables with their logs, this thing would become uh, log, concave, log convex in y, y i's and z i's, in the log of y i's and z i's. And it is also log concave in the uh, kappa i's. Okay. Uh, because the denominator is linear in the kappa i's, uh, the log of the denominator is linear in the kappa i's, and the log of this generating polynomial is also uh, concave in the kappa i's. Uh, so this is a saddle point problem, and you can actually efficiently solve it. Uh, so I don't have time, and I won't go through the other side, which is actually the uh, more mathematically involved one. Uh, but you can actually use some duality and some results about uh, real stability and stronger Riley measures to prove that uh, the result of this gives you an e to the approximation. The whole sum. Question: Is it clear that the separation question here is hard? The separation question for and you have for the geometry programs, like you have uh, for the ex for the exponential linear inequalities. I think I have an example, but I don't have it on my head. So, as in, in particular, if you could solve the separation question approximately, you could solve the program approximately. So, which means you only need an exponential. Uh, sure. So, right. Yeah. So that's that's true, and you can actually solve the uh, separation question approximately. This. This thing that I showed here uh, is basically solving the problem. There is an there is an upper bound for this too. Okay. So, so you can solve this approximately, but okay. yeah, uh, but you can't solve this exactly necessarily. The separation uh, thing is not exactly solvable. Um, yeah. Uh, so that completes the picture. Uh, so for the product, you still have some caveats, but you. You can't say something about the resulting product distribution of two contrary measures. Okay, with that, I want to conclude. Uh, so, uh, the gist of the talk was that strong UI measures have very uh, nice properties that make them somehow similar for analogs uh, of log concave functions in the discrete world. Uh, so, the open question is whether this can be uh, this can become an uh, a well-developed framework for discrete optimization. Um, this, I think, we have already discussed. Uh, whether we can approximate this uh, better than e to the d is not known. We don't have any lower bounds for it. Uh, finding the max, we have matching lower bounds, so there is no hope there. But maybe for the sum, we can do some Markov chain method or something like that. Uh, and the big open question is whether we can find the larger family <laughs> discrete distributions, uh, which are still tractable in the sense that you can find their mode that can do optimization and calculate them. So can this also be done to take some peak norm of this product in some sense, you know? Uh, piece, I mean, just want to see, does it interplay between the sum and the max? Uh, uh, I haven't considered that. <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you so much.